everyone, I am Jen, the social media manager at Williams Sonoma and an avid baker, so I'm very excited to be here with Chef Nick from Bouchon Bakery in Yonkville, California. Welcome morning, back. Morning, Jen. Glad to be here. Um, so last time you were here, we made challah, um, yes. and now we're going to make macarons for Easter. So tell us a little bit about them. Um, well, macarons, number one seller at our bakery, by far. Um, we, we have about 20,000 a month that go out to the yeah. guests. And that's just the big ones. We also make mini ones, and there are even many more of those. Um, so usually for, for special holidays and things like that, we, we commemorate them with some kind of macaroon. Um, and it seemed natural to do, since it's springtime, to do sort of a robin's egg kind of thing. And it's a favorite candy of a lot of us, um, the, the one with the malt. Yes. You know, the malt that's center. That's a great flavor. Yeah, so that's what we were playing with. Um, we've done this for a few years now. But this year, we have K plus M chocolate. Um, so we're filling it with that, and that's a collaboration between Chef Keller and uh, Armando Mani, so he's an olive oil producer in Italy. Um, so that chocolate we're using for the filling, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Mm -hmm. But um, first we're gonna make macarons. Very exciting. Which is, yes, it's exciting. It's, it's a challenge, I think, um, for a lot of people, more mentally than it is in real, in, in actual fact. Mm -hmm. it, it can be, it's just, it's kind of a, it okay. It can be a little temperamental. And, yes, yeah. yeah. But yeah. I think, we have a recipe in our book that sort of streamlines some of those things, and if you follow the directions, it works. Great. Um, and the directions are very clear, so it should And if you guys out. have any questions while we're doing this demo, just leave them in the comments and we'll answer as many as we can during the broadcast. So should we get started? Yes. So we already have our, our sugar going, um, okay. so we don't have to wait too long for that. Um, it's basically at a boil right now, so it's at about 212 degrees. Um, and when that, when the sugar syrup comes to a boil, it's just sugar and water, mm -hmm. then we start our egg whites whipping in the KitchenAid. It's best if you use uh, room temperature egg whites. Why is that? They get more volume. Okay. There you go. So, we can start them pretty much on high on this mixture. Okay. You don't want to go too fast because you get a better foam when you do sort of a medium high to high speed. When it's the highest speed, sometimes you get some big bubbles and some little bubbles and it's not as stable. Okay. So you want it to be even. And one thing that we do to stabilize the meringue a little bit is we add a pinch of salt. Sometimes you see recipes with cream of tartar or something mm -hmm. like that, but salt also works. So you just put a little bit. And then basically you have to wait for the you have to wait for the egg whites for a little bit. It probably takes as long as it's gonna take the idea is that you have this at 212 degrees. Okay. The final temperature for the sugar is 248 degrees. In that amount of time, the egg whites should be ready. Okay. If the egg whites are getting too stiff, I can add that. Yeah, you want a really loose kind of uh, foam with when you're when you're gonna add the Sort of soft, soft peaks mm -hmm. when you add your sugar at the final at the final stage. If you see your egg whites going a little too far, okay. don't panic. Just slow the mixer down to the lowest speed. If the egg whites get a little bit over mixed, it's not going to be the end of the world. Okay. That's the the joy of having that Italian meringue. Great. Yeah. French meringue is a bit French, more. Fresh. We have a question. Merit wants to know if Chef you have any tips for separating all of those egg whites. Mm. You must do a lot. Yeah, and I think we talked about this last time too, um, because we made an egg wash, and it's, it's something you can use the yolks for. So what I do is I crack all my eggs into one large bowl, okay. and then I pull them out with my hands, the yolks. Because instead of passing them back and forth with the eggshell, okay. which mm -hmm. cracks the yolks, um, because they're sharp, right. then you, your hands are a lot more uh, gentle on the, on the egg yolks. Mm -hmm. So you just have two bowls, you crack your eggs in one and you pull the yolks out with your hands and put them in the other bowl. So it looks like our sugar is actually just okay. about ready. Mm -hmm. um, and it's uh, sort of, you can, you can keep an eye on it when it starts to look thick and the bubbles um, pop really slowly. Okay. Then you know your sugar is about ready and you can, you can know that you're ready to pour. Great. It's good to have like visual cues, not just go by the, the, the monitor. monitor. I just know. 
Yeah. So now we're ready. So turn off the stove for me. And we're going to pour with a mixer on um, medium to medium high. It depends on your mixer. I hate to say that, but it does. Mm -hmm. And you want to pour the, the syrup in not too quickly, but not too slowly, because you want to pour enough so it doesn't splatter everywhere. Right. Um, and make sure all your syrup gets incorporated. And I see that you're aiming for in between the whisk and the edge of the bowl, just right in the middle. If your stream is really thin, it splatters more. So you want to have kind of a just a nice, medium, steady pour. Don't dump everything at once, or your egg whites can sort of cook and scramble and you get sort of a grainy looking meringue instead of something that's nice and smooth and shiny. You already see the volume that it's involved Yeah, it, it basically more than doubles in volume almost. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do this for about three minutes. Um, and meanwhile, I'm going to show you how we're going to pipe the, pipe the macros. Great. If you want to set a timer, you can. Or you can just know that it's going to be three minutes. Yeah, I, I go by I go by sight a lot, but I think when you're starting out, you mm -hmm. set the timer and then you know. It, I think it helps. So we're gonna grab our our trays. our trays. So we already lined these. Do you want to talk about how we line them? Yes. So in the bakery, we use parchment paper because we do probably 40 trays of macarons a day. So if we do silk hats. That would be 40 silk pads. It would be 40 silk pads for our dishwashers to have to clean and to dry. And they're very expensive as well. So if you do one tray, it's nice to have a silk hat, but I still like I still like using parchment. So in order to in order to make sure you have the right size, we make sort of a template. And we've already done this. But you take a cookie cutter, the size that you want your macaroon to be, you put it on the, the parchment and you draw a circle. And Very these are two and a quarter inch. Um, and those are those are sort of our large macarons, and it is kind of a staple at Bouchon to have these sort of oversized, like really macaroni. lush macarons. So you don't have to have just two bites, you know, three or four. Um, and then make sure this is very important that the side with the ink is facing down. And how do you keep the paper in place? That I will show you when we pipe the macarons. I have a, a little trick for that. So it's. It's been about three minutes, and you can see that your your um, whites are not quite cool to the touch, but they're certainly not hot. They're probably just a little bit above above body temperature. So we can turn off our, our mixer. I have a little trick for that. I sort of keep it on, and I I take the to get the batter to come Yeah, I take the whisk out, out, but yeah. you want to slow down as you do that so you don't end up with That's a, good a meringue all over the kitchen, which is kind of fun in a way, but a pain to clean. So you have, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a little bit more on our whisk so you can see how stiff they are. But they're still very shiny. Should we show the, let's show them the bowl inside so they can see how much volume that Oh, we have another question. Sharon would like to know, can you make these with a traditional mixer, hand mixer versus a stand mixer? Yes, it's, it's not a problem. You just have to stand there with a, with a mixer for a while and you can't do anything else while that's happening, but it works just as well. You're probably just going to mix with one hand as you pour the syrup in, so that's just a little bit of a balance, but that should be fine. Yeah. It's this is this is one one thing where you know your KitchenAid comes in handy. You know, if some things it just it just works better for. Mm -hmm. And now we have the confectioner sugar and almond flour mixture, which in the bakery we call TPT, which basically means my French is terrible, but basically means temps pour temps. So it's equal parts of something. Okay. So it's equal parts almond flour and confectioner sugar. So there's no flour in this recipe. So these are actually a great gluten-free yes. treat. Yep. We have our egg whites. So we have two measurements of egg whites for this recipe, the one that we use in the meringue and the one that we use for the base. With these egg whites, I've already added our food coloring. It's a nice way to sort of get the process started 
where your food coloring is a little bit diluted before mm -hmm. you add it to the to the almond flour and confectioner sugar. So you pour that right in the middle. Make sure you get all of it, especially with a recipe like this. It's important to have all your all your ingredients in the bowl. You don't want to leave anything left in the in where you measured the ingredients because that, that will make a huge difference. If you have a quarter of an egg white missing in the recipe, it's gonna make a big difference with your final product. So you don't wanna waste any. And the coloring that you used in here, it's a blue gel? Blue gel. Okay. And you can, you can play with the coloring. You know, I put a little bit less than I think we'll need okay. in case we need to add more because it's hard to take the coloring out. Right. So you just kind of mix slowly. And you only have to mix this part slowly because you don't want to end up with confectioner sugar again all over the kitchen. We're actually going to mix this part quite a bit. And so this method that you're doing, we talked about this earlier, you're doing a cooked meringue, Italian meringue. There's yes. another way to make macarons, which is the French method. So tell us why you chose to do this method. So when I started at the bakery, which was a long time ago, we used to use the French method, mm -hmm. um, and that is basically an uncooked meringue. So the sugar is added to the egg whites raw. And you get a very nice product, but the thing is, is with that method, you have to allow the macarons after you pipe them to dry and form a skin. Mm -hmm. So they get a nice shell. In the bakery, that's very difficult, especially I started out in New York. And New York, as anybody who lives there, has terrible weather. It's very humid in the mm -hmm. summer. It's very dry indoors during the winter because of the heat. So you would go from having macaroons that dried out in 15, 20 minutes to having macaroons that would take hours to dry. Yeah, you just have to keep checking on them. And, exactly. Yeah. You know, touch them and, and, and put them in a hallway that has a breeze and all these kind of things. Mm -hmm. And it, it, was, it was very difficult to control. With the Italian meringue, you just have much more control. You can pipe them and put them in the oven right away. It's a lot faster. In fact, you don't want to let them dry. What happens if you let them dry? They can crack. Okay. And not only crack, but they sort of look like the beginnings of a volcano. They get, they get really uh, sort of dry on the edge and they start to build in the middle and then they can open up. Oh my gosh. So this, is a, this takes a little bit of um, elbow grease. In the bakery, we have two different, two KitchenAid bowls. So actually I do this in the, in the KitchenAid or in a larger mixer in the bakery this part, because it's very stiff. But this is where you can tell that you're gonna have your nice color too. And if I wanted to, I would add more color, but I think it's, I think it's gonna be good. And this seems to be pretty true to how they'll turn out, so you don't need to necessarily add more depending on what happens when they bake, right? No, they, okay. they shouldn't get too much color in the oven. Okay. So once that's all mixed in, We're gonna start adding our meringue. So I do it in two stages. The first stage you can really mix, mm -hmm. and, the, and the, second, the second stage you're gonna be a little bit more gentle. And this, does this just to loosen the batter before you whip the rest? Exactly. Okay. So again, it's a bit stiff, but it's really important that at this stage, you get all your, your mix together. You don't want to have dry spots. It's very important to have a, an even mix. And you can also see how your color is going to be. Mm -hmm. It is a bit lighter. Mm -hmm. it's, going to, it's going to lighten up, but I have a, quite a, a bit to mix, so it'll, it'll get a little bit more blue. So this is starting to look this is starting to look good, but you can also tell that it's not very smooth. It's mm -hmm. a little bit grainy. So I need to I need to stir it some more, but I also have more egg whites to go. So it's gonna it's gonna look very nice in the end. Now, as I said before, you want to make sure you scrape everything out. So you need the rubber spatula and you need to get everything out of the bowl. And now we can start being a little bit more gentle in our folding. And what happens at this stage 
if you whip it too much. You can get, if you whip it, you whip it or you over mix this part too much, you get a really thin macaroon and you get very large feet. Okay. Which I'll show you the feet a little bit later, mm -hmm. what I mean by that. So this is the most important stage in mixing the macaroons. Is if I cook my sugar a little bit too much, you know, that's not gonna be the end of the world. I can control it with this. If my egg whites get a little bit stiff or a little bit soft, you can control it here. Mm -hmm. So I mix it until the little ridges start to just disappear. So right now, you can see that the ridges are, are staying. Okay. They're not really disappearing. So I mix it a little bit more. And this is just sort of the perfectionist in me that will like take that, take that time. If, if I were to pipe it right now and, and put it in the oven, you'd have a, a fine macaroon. It may not have a perfectly glossy finish, okay. but it would, it would be great. It's not gonna be a, you know, a baking disaster. Can we do one more test of that just to show everyone how that looks? Yes. So basically I let some fall back in and you can see these little ridges, now they're just starting to disappear. Yeah, you don't want them to fully Exactly, you don't want it to be it. liquid or to smooth out, but you want them to, to disappear so we don't, that we don't have any kind of um, point after, after we pipe. Okay, so that looks pretty good. Beautiful. Now the next step is piping, the piping. My favorite part. So I have a piping bag ready for you and a piping bag ready for me. I'll show you also how I, how I make the piping bag. So I really like these plastic ones, the disposable ones, because I don't like to clean the piping bags. It's very clean. So you want to cut the tip off. You can also decide how much you need it based on your tip size too, which is nice. And then I fold the bag over like this. Okay and I make sure it's all folded over. This sounds like a step that's not necessary, but it's really important. I open up the bag, because this, this sort of, this fold over will protect your hand mm -hmm. and keep it from getting messy. Then you put the tip in the bag. And make sure that the tip is coming all the way out, that you cut the hole big enough. Mm -hmm. And we put a little bit, we tuck that, that end of the bag into the tip itself. And is that just to keep the batter from flowing? Exactly. Okay. So now I have that ready. I can fill my bag. Some people like to have uh, some kind of container, like a, a pitcher to put the bag in. That, that can help too. But sometimes you don't have that, so you, can, you don't need it. So I hold, the, I hold the bowl like this, and I take a little bit of my mix. I put it in the bag, and then I scrape it against my finger. So it takes everything off the spatula, and I don't waste anything. And how much of the bag would you fill up? I would fill maybe a third to a half of the bag. Just so you have room to grip it. Yes, and the... The problem is, with an over full bag, it becomes really difficult to control. Not that it's, it's too heavy, but you don't, it's, it's hard to squeeze out. Okay. So after I filled it, I fold my, my bag up like this, and because I tucked it in, nothing's going to fall out, mm -hmm. so I have plenty of, plenty of time to, to fix my bag. So I scrape all the, all the mix down, and then... I pinch the bag, so nothing's gonna come out. Mm -hmm. Then I can put my, my bag down like this and get my tray. I'm not gonna have any, anything dripping. Mm -hmm. um, in the meantime, you're gonna use this, but okay. first I'm gonna just show you what I would do in the bakery. I would scrape down the sides, because what can happen here is that while you're piping one tray, this macaroon batter can dry out. Oh, okay. And that's gonna cause some problems in the baking. So I do that and it, Keeps everything nice and neat and tidy as well. So you can go ahead and fill your bag. We have a question from Bianca. Can you use a sill pad instead of a parchment? Absolutely. It works very well. In fact, at home, I would recommend a sill pad. 
It's just that at the bakery, we go through so many that I, I don't. And also, I think parchment's a little bit more accessible. Silk pads are very expensive, and I don't think people need to feel that they need to, they need to use them or be limited by, by the equipment. You know, you can really do this with a parchment paper or with a silk pad. Great. Oop, let's not do that. So now I said I had a trick for attaching the parchment paper to the sheet pan, which is to take a tiny amount of macaroon batter, just a tiny bit, and pipe it in four corners. And that'll just keep it in place as you're piping. Exactly. Don't put too much because then you have to clean the, the sheet pan too much and it's, you don't want to have to scrape it. So you make sure your parchment paper is in the middle. I'm going to give you that sheet pan. And then you can, you can pipe some. So my bag is ready to pipe. I hold the nozzle in the middle of where my, I want my macaroon to be. About uh, an inch, half an inch to an inch above the, above the parchment. And then I squeeze until I just get to the line. I stop squeezing and I take it away. Okay. I do a little bit of a... Just to not get the A chip. little bit of a rosette, yeah, or okay. something like that. It kind of smooths it out. But if you've made your mix correctly, you don't need to worry too much about it. In fact, I'll do one without doing that. And are you just going straight up and down? Like the bag is not at an angle? No, the bag's not at an angle. Okay. It, may, it may be a slight angle, but it should be, it should be straight up and down. It's okay, if mine don't look pretty, they're gonna be the bottoms and yours are gonna be the bottoms. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Oop. So you really want to make sure that they're even, but if they're not even, I will show you what to do after they're baked. Because you want your tops and bottoms the same size. Okay. There's nothing like watching somebody pipe or being watched. It's, it's really the best feeling in the whole world. <laughs> there we go, that's perfect. So up and down. Yeah. We have a question from Karen. She's wondering if she should use the convection setting on her oven when baking these macarons. Yes, you can use either. Uh, Confection is good for a couple of reasons. It produces a much more even heat, so you don't have to deal with turning the turning the tray around in the oven, which you don't really want to handle macaroons while they bake anyway. So you don't have ones getting too dark in the back and too light in the front. You know, you'll, be, you'll have a much more even bake. Also, they give the, the macaroons a little bit of spring when you put them in. However, if you don't have a convection oven, that's fine as well. The first restaurant I worked in, we only had a deck oven basically, which is the sort of oven you use to bake bread in. I don't know if you've ever been to a pizza restaurant and they just have a single a single shelf that you slide the super hot we didn't we couldn't control the temperature in the oven it was always I don't know 400 degrees and we baked the macaroons in there um, so you can you can do it either way you just have to be a little bit flexible but the convection oven is what we use at the bakery it, it works really well the next step is very important as well. I think I've said every step is important because I, I feel close to them. <laughs> but um, this is where we tap the macaroons to even them out a little bit. So you just need to tap the bottom of the tray gently. And since we've, since we've attached the parchment with a little bit of batter, mm -hmm. it's not going to go anywhere. You don't have to worry about the parchment sliding or losing any macaroons. And here you can see all the, all the little blemishes sort of go away. It's fun at the, at the bakery when we do these, it's probably three hours of this noise. Oh my gosh. And I can see 
see like the air bubbles are coming to the surface. Yeah. So. And they, they should go away when we bake it. Mm -hmm. Looks good. Great. So now we can put them in the oven. It's good, to, it's good to put them right in the middle, but that's the, the nice thing about a convection oven. It, it, it gives you a, a nice thing to heat. And would you rotate these halfway through or just leave them in there? No, I would leave them in. Okay. We have a question from Isabel. Are these gluten-free? They are. So it's a great gluten-free option um, for you to make for your guests. That doesn't, you don't need to use a substitute flour. This is, is always going to be gluten free because you have almond flour, which is not flour at all, it's just ground almonds, and confectioner sugar, which has no, it's just sugar. Um, so it's, it's a great option. And you don't have to, you don't have to, I don't want to use the word fake it, but I'm going to. You don't have to, you know, it's not, there's no pretending. You don't have to swap or substitute. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, so the next step is we're going to make the filling. Great. Now I have the chocolate already melted which is our K plus M chocolate. And this chocolate is very special. First of all, it's made by the, the company that I work for, so that's, that's really great. And it's, it's, it's just a beautiful product. So what we do is we have a chocolatier, her name's Chi Bui, and she sources the beans from you know, very specific places. So the one that we're using right now is from Ecuador. Okay. And it's a dark milk chocolate, which basically sounds confusing, but it's a darker milk chocolate than the most you're gonna most of the ones you're gonna buy commercially, mm -hmm. and that means that it has a much more um, interesting, intense flavor. Um, you don't lose the it's not all sugar basically, so you have a, a really a really remarkable chocolate. This one is is very fruity, um, and we'll try some more later, and you can see you can see the differences. Um, and this chocolate that we're using is actually on our website, the dark milk. So I have the chocolate melted, so we don't have to wait for that to melt. And the next, the next thing the is butter the buttercream. Cream. I also have the buttercream made. We make Italian buttercream. You can really use any buttercream method that you want, but this one works really well. It's in our cookbook, and it's very stable, and you can add any kind of chocolate or, or flavoring that, that you want to it. Um, and also, we'll have this recipe on our blog later this week, so you guys can take a look at that. I'm gonna step behind you and put it on the the double boiler a little bit. And this is a good this is a good trick, which I find out which burner I need to turn on. In the bakery, we would put this on a mixer and we would start mixing it, and we actually use a blowtorch to soften the buttercream. Because it gets a little bit hard at room temperature. We made it about an hour ago, so we're just going to warm it up a little bit. So I heat it just a bit, because you can see right now it's not, it's not too smooth. Pretty great. But you, you put a little bit of heat, and we're going to get this buttercream nice and smooth. I don't want to melt it, because it is butter. Emily wants to know the name of the chocolate again. The chocolate is called K plus M. K plus M stands for Keller and Mani. So Chef Keller is the, is the owner of the French Laundry and the chef there and Bouchon Bakery, Ad Hoc, Per Se in New York. And he has a partnership with Armando Mani and he, this partnership has gone back for, for quite a few years and Armando Mani is a producer of olive oil. Um, they got together because both chocolate and olive oil have a lot of health benefits actually. Mm -hmm. Antioxidants and you know, they're both delicious things so it seemed natural to try to put them together to them and that's what they've done and the olive oil does it replace some of the cocoa butter how does that how is it incorporated it doesn't replace the cocoa butter you need the cocoa butter still in order to get the nice um shine and the snap on the chocolate so mm -hmm. it, it has the mouth feel of uh, of chocolate but we add a little bit of uh, olive oil in order to have more of the health benefit and it gives a little bit of um that sort of that sort of flavor so once your buttercream is ready, nice and smooth and glossy, we're going to add the chocolate. You don't want the chocolate too hot either because it will melt the buttercream. Mm -hmm. So you want to get all this chocolate in there. 
And this is not your typical filling. What do you normally put in these Robin Hood's eggs macarons? Um, well, right now we're using, we're using the uh, Keller and Mani chocolate. Um, in the past, what we've done is we've made a malted buttercream. So I used another uh, Valrona dark chocolate actually, and we add malt syrup to really heighten that, wow. heighten that malt flavor. But I found this chocolate has those malty notes, so it's not necessary. So then we're gonna mix with a whisk, the buttercream and the chocolate together. You wanna do this fairly quickly so that the butter doesn't set. Um, if you were to make this ahead, would you just do the buttercream separately, warm it up and then add chocolate or could you keep this ahead of time? You could make this ahead, but I think in order to have a very uh, glossy, easy to pipe product. This is the, the easier way. So now you can see the buttercream is really shiny. So make sure you get all of that buttercream off the whisk. We have another question from Jeff. Where can he get the recipe? It will be on the Williams Sonoma blog later this week. We'll have the buttercream, the macarons, and how to put them all together. So the buttercream is ready, and we can we can fill the macarons. Now, I have some already finished. Some macarons already finished that we can fill, so we don't have to wait for the ones in the oven. And they're here. So when they come out of the oven, they're really easy to get off the, if you use a silpat, they're very easy to get off, and they're also very easy to get off the parchment. If you use a silpat, this part is gonna be very shiny, but these are baked on parchment, so they, they have a little bit matte. of a matte finish, yeah. Okay. But they come off very easily, you can see nothing stuck. And talk a little bit about the speckle that we put on the top here. You know what? We forgot to, to speckle the ones Now on that I think about it, we forgot to speckle the <laughs> But we can show how to do that because I, we, we still have some mix. Oh, right. We can show how to do that because I think it's important. Um, let's... We just need some parchment. So we can do it right on the table here. I get so excited about the chocolate <laughs> that I forgot to speckle. So you're going to pipe the macaroon. And then I have a little bit of brown food coloring that I've mixed with vodka. So it's about equal parts vodka and brown food coloring. The vodka is, helps dilute the, the coloring so I can do what I'm about to do. I'm gonna make a little bit of a splatter and a little bit of mess. But it also has the, pro alcohol has the property of drying quickly. So it's not gonna add any water right. or damage the macaroon in any way. So you need to have a small brush. And then we need to tap it. I use my finger like this. Yeah, and it gets that speckled up. And then you get a little bit of a speckle. Mm -hmm. And now is when we would tap the macarons like we did on the sheet pan. Okay. If you put too much, the macaroons can crack. So don't put too much speckle. Just a little bit for a hint of that color. And I'm gonna also show you that when these macaroons are done, we can speckle them afterwards as well. Why would you do it before versus after? To make sure none of the food coloring comes off on your fingers. Okay. But because we've had the alcohol, it should dry anyway. But mm -hmm. if you're like me and sometimes forgetful and you get caught up in the moment, you can do it afterwards. Okay. So everything will be okay. And I have two more piping bags ready. And is this with the same tip? This is with a, this, I'm using a slightly larger tip, okay. but you're using the same tip. Okay. If you don't have a piping tip, you can do this part without a piping tip, but it's easy to use the same one you've already used for the macaroons. 
So again, we fill the bag the same way as we did for the for piping the macarons. Not too much. Let me give you a little bit. It's okay with the KitchenAid. Sometimes it gets a little bit cold. The buttercream needs to be reheated a little bit because room temperature, you know, the butter is not nice and smooth. So if your room is you know, less than 70 degrees, the butter can stay hard. So you, it's nice to put it over a water bag. And it's easier to do that in a mixing bowl than with a KitchenAid bowl. So the one I'm using right here is um, an 808 for the large. Okay. Uh, 806. Which I think is, is just about the right size. The recipe that we'll be posting, it's um, one half inch and three eighths inch. Yeah, and those, but the, yeah, and those numbers, when you, when you buy uh, pastry chips, they're actually pretty standard. I like a lot of filling. So what I do is I pipe one, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna check to see if I like it. It's about, I pipe, I hold my piping bag about uh, a, a half inch above the macaroon, and then I pipe about a uh, half inch to the, from the Just edge. So there's room to sandwich it together? Yeah, because when we sandwich it, it's gonna go right to the edge. But you wanna have, you wanna have about that, that sort of look. That height. Mm -hmm. So it looks really full and delicious. I'm always sad when I eat a macaron and I can't see the filling. Exactly. And I don't, I know that's not enough. <laughs> so now you can do all your, all the, all the bottoms. Use a little more. And then we can sandwich them. and you make sure that you put enough filling. You're doing a good job. And I'm glad that you know how much filling to put. <laughs> it's, it's, something that, it's something that is important and it's something that people sometimes, sometimes forget, even when, you know, even at the bakery when you're training somebody new to make macarons, it's like, don't be cheap with the filling. Make sure you have enough. Because it's really where the flavor in the macaroon is from also. The shells are basically all the same. Sometimes we, like with our pistachio macaroon, we actually add a pistachio paste. Or with, um, let me think about what other flavors. Like raspberry, we'll add some raspberry flavors. Um, and, but with, with a lot of them, the truth is they're just color. So you really need to get the flavor in the filling. So now you could eat them now, but mm. I like to wait um, and put them in the fridge. Yes. Yes. It's best overnight. In fact, that's another question people have a lot about storage is one good thing to do now is if you make them in, you can make these in advance. You know, you have a party in a few, in a few weeks, you can make your macaroons now. And what you can do is you can put them on a, on a tray like this, wrap them very well to make sure no air gets inside, and then freeze them. And also, just letting it sit like that, the shell kind of absorbs the filling so it gets a little bit chewier. So right now, mm -hmm. the max are probably crunchy, um, and I like that texture after it's set. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's really where you get that nice, that nice contrast between a crunchy shell just on the outside yes. and that chewy consistency. And then you bite into it, it kind of melts together. Exactly. Yeah. And what, what, we're, what we're talking about putting them in the fridge or the freezer, so if you freeze them, you want to let them thaw out for a few hours in the refrigerator so they don't get too much condensation. And then if they're in the refrigerator, you want to leave them at room temperature for probably an hour at least, and so they're room temperature when you eat them. Mm -hmm. That's another really important thing that people forget, is they want, they're hungry, you know, they see a beautiful macaroon, they want to eat it right away. 
wait. It'll be really hard. <laughs> It'll be hard, and yeah. actually the flavor's not there. You know, things taste better at room temperature than they do if they're really cold. So, at least the flavors are stronger. So, you need to wait. And if it's a buttercream like this, the buttercream has a much better mouthfeel at room temperature as well. Mm -hmm. So, you, you need to wait. So, since we're going to wait on these, mm -hmm. I would love to taste chocolate. Great! So, I'm going to put those over there. And we have a whole selection of, of chocolates. What I've brought today is all of our Nicaragua varieties. So we go from dark to milk. Okay. And it's one of the, the newer varieties. And I think it's one that uh, it's just when I, I taste it, I never really tasted chocolate like this before um, for a couple of reasons. Flavor is really off the charts. But also the, and I think this is something people forget, especially with um, smaller producers, is the mouthfeel. You know, a big chocolate company um, has a lot of equipment, you know, a lot of a lot of know-how and a lot of technology in order to, that they can get that really creamy, um, smooth mouthfeel. And you have a lot of small producers, and they, they don't really they don't really get there, in my opinion. You know, the chocolate may be grainy, or it may not have a beautiful snap. But these, one, these ones all have that. And it, to me, it's very important in order to taste the chocolate correctly that not only does it have the right flavor, but that it has the right feeling in, in, in your mouth. Um, so these ones are all from uh, Nicaragua, except for the green one, which we'll get to at the end. Okay. Um, so we're going to start with the uh, milk chocolate, because I think it's, you can, you can do anything you want, but I like to go from, from light to dark. Okay. Um, because the dark one is so intense, you're not going to be able to think about anything else when you taste the milk. Um, so the milk one is, is here, and you can even see the color, which I think is, is so much fun. Change. Um, and you can see with it's so different... so much darker. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's almost black. And when you melt it, it's super dark. So it's, it's not really a lie, you know, the, the packaging. It's, it's dark. And so we'll, we'll start with the, the milk one. And this is just pure nostalgia to me. It's like something, something from childhood. And when you taste chocolate like this, it's best, especially when you get to the dark one, but even with the, even with the milk one, it's just to kind of leave it in your mouth for a little while and let it melt. Don't just, don't just chew it because... Like I was just doing this now. Yeah. <laughs> you just have to... You can talk while you're doing it. It's super it. buttery. Mm -hmm. And there's no graininess. Mm-hmm. That's really good. The milk one is very creamy. I like it. That's a good eating chocolate. Mm-hmm. This is, a, this, this is, I, I'm a real milk chocolate lover, which people, I think when they hear that, being a pastry chef or whatever, you're supposed to like all dark chocolate, but mm -hmm. this one just brings me right back. I'm a semi-sweet girl, so I feel like the middle one's going to mm -hmm. be mine. Mm-hmm. So, dark milk. That's the, the kind, we used one from Ecuador in the, in the macaroon, but right now we're gonna taste one from Nicaragua. And how do those two differ? So I think the Ecuador is a little bit more, a little bit more fruity, a little bit more acidic. And this one is a little bit more, I think, savory. Okay. So it has those, those fruit notes, but it also has a real maltiness. Oh, I really like this one. Mm -hmm. Again, we're not talking because we're letting the chocolate melt and we're very polite not to talk with our <laughs> mouth full. But this one is, has a little bit more, I think, um, it's a little bit um, more intense, less sweet. You get more also of the, a little hint of uh, a little bit of more acidity. It's still really creamy, mm -hmm. but I do like this one out more. I taste the olive oil in this. Mm -hmm. Especially at the end. Mm -hmm. It's very strong, sort of. But it's not off-putting, like, oh my no. gosh, I'm eating, I'm eating olive oil. Because yeah. this, this olive oil, it should be noted too, a lot of olive oil has a kind of, it's almost fiery when you, when you sip it. It has kind of, you know, it burns your throat, but this one is very rounded, and that's what you get there. 
the real fruit of the, the, the olive. And then this one here. And the dark. We're just thinking about it. It is. A, it's more intense. I do. I think I'm more still in the middle. Mm -hmm. A little bit sweeter. Mm -hmm. This one, I think, I get a little bit more of the berries, like red fruits. I think this would be nice with the macarons, though, because mm -hmm. the meringue is so sweet. Mm -hmm. Needs to be a good contrast. Yeah, and and the thing about that buttercream. Is you could use any of these chocolates and substitute one one for the one. other, and you get it. You get a different. If you're a real dark chocolate lover, I will go ahead and use the dark chocolate. And another thing you can do with this buttercream, if you're making a cake, frost a cake with it. I think this would be this would be great on a cake. You know, if 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 it's your ten year old's birthday, I would use a milk chocolate, <laughs> and they're gonna they're gonna flip out because it's gonna be just the best chocolate they've ever had. Um, if it's you know. Your parents, maybe you'd use the dark chocolate. And then one. the last one we're going to try is peppermint. So we're playing around with a little different different flavors in our chocolate, and this is, this is one of them. So we use a dark chocolate, and then we add a little bit of peppermint to it. And does the peppermint steep in the, or how does the peppermint get incorporated? We actually use a peppermint oil. Okay. Because you need to, you can't add too much. Um, liquid to the chocolate and you don't want to adjust the 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 formula so you have the same mouth feel but with a little bit of peppermint i think people get scared with mint sometimes because they're like oh my gosh it's going to taste like toothpaste mm -hmm. it's not at all like that that's really nice that would be a good holiday Macaron mm -hmm. filling. Mm -hmm. And it works, again, you can use that in your in your macarons. And what, one thing that would be great if you're a home chocolatier is you make your peppermint bark with this. That'd be nice. Or you just eat it like that. You don't have to go through the steps of making peppermint bark. But it would be, it would be great if you put some candies on top. More just for a little crunch, yes. Mm -hmm. That was delicious. Hot chocolate with these. That's something we Mint do at the bakery chocolate. too. Mm -hmm. You just have to, if you have one of those, um, it's like a... An immersion blender, blender. You, you have an immersion blender and you heat your milk and you pour it over the chocolate and you can just use dark chocolate and you immersion blend it, you have hot chocolate. You don't need to, so it won't be Swiss Miss, you know, you have, you have something really, really delicious. And again, something you could do for fun on the holidays or, or any time, you could, you could do a selection of different, you could do a selection of different hot chocolates and try all the different ones because this one, mm -hmm. the dark one, if you, it works beautifully in hot chocolate. That one, that one yeah. sounds amazing. Yeah. We've, and we've, all of these chocolates, they're available on the Finesse store yes. website. We have them all. Great. Thank I you. Mean, you I mean, oh, have a question about the chocolate. Are these safe for someone with a nut allergy? Yes, they're not produced, currently we're not producing them in a, in a, in a facility that we also have nut products, um, but I so they are. Are there any other questions? Uh, Hallie had one question. Do you recommend gel food coloring? Yes, I use gel food coloring, but if the powder, if you have the powder one, you can use that as well. So the powder one, you would add at the same at the same time that you would add the gel ones. I think. You can use basically any food coloring. The ones I would stay away from are the really liquidy ones. Some of them are almost like water, mm -hmm. and they can really change the, it's like what I was talking about with changing the formula of the chocolate, it would change you the don't want to add water content that. of your, your macro. Um, that's, that's important. So the gel ones work well, you don't have to work, uh, add too much, and the powder ones work well too. The thing about the powder ones is that they're really messy, and you get powder sometimes all over the place. I tend to stay away from those. And one more question from Pia. 
Nick, you had mentioned um, you would explain the feet. Yes. Oh, yes. Could you talk a little bit more about that? So with our, I'm going to check the ones in the other. So they're a little bit, I did not set a timer. Oh. <laughs> so they're a little rule bit. Rule number one. Rule number one. Set a timer when you are making things. Well, let, we should just show. So we have the ones that are, do we have the ones that we just built? Oh, right here. So the feet are these, the little crinkly part at the bottom. So you don't want them really to come out too far from the macaroon, and, but you still want to have those. What would make the feet come out a little bit? So if you mix, if you over mix the okay. macaroon batter, you, you can have really big feet. Instead of just rising up like that. Yeah, and if you, if you under mix it, you'll, you'll still have these. If you under mix it, they won't be nice and smooth on top. Okay. That's, that'll be the difference. The ones, the ones in the oven are too, they're just a little bit brown, which I'll show you. Here's what not to do. <laughs> oh yeah, you do get that height. So the, pro the only real problem here is that you lose some of the, the beautiful blue color, mm -hmm. but you can see that they rise. And after after a couple of minutes, they're going to they're going to fall a little bit, and you're going to have a nice smooth macaroon. And I can actually you can actually at this point take speckle your your speckle. How long would you leave them on the tray before you take them off? Until they're room temperature. It, it probably a half an hour. It won't take too long. You need to be patient with this step so you don't put too much. And I like the way you're doing it because then every single one's a little bit different. Yeah. Great. Are there any other questions? I think we're good. Thank you so much for coming you're today. Thank you. Um, and just a reminder for everyone, the recipe will be on our blog later this week. Um, the macarons are available at all Bouchon Bakery locations through Easter. Thank you guys. Bye. Thank you.